And Virilio says that one of the means by way of which this, uh, the spread of fear has happened on a global scale is by means of what he calls the information bomb, uh, which is analogous to the population bomb of Ehrlich and the ecological bomb. With the information bomb, uh, we have the synchronization of emotion on a global scale so that when disasters happen, uh, the bomb goes off every time a disaster happens and is reported upon in the news and in the media. This is, it's, and it's a non-local phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon that synchronizes an atmosphere and a, and, and a general background paranoia of terror and fear through this information bomb that is constantly going off all the time. And so, as he says, with live events, uh, we're in the, the acceleration not of history, but of reality. So he makes a distinction between the acceleration in this book on the administration of fear, between the acceleration of reality versus the acceleration of history. He says, the acceleration of history was based on the movement from uh, horses to uh, steam engines to trains to jet engines to rockets and so forth. That all has to do with what he has elsewhere described the transport revolution, where we have a, rev a revolution in the dromosphere of moving a body, the physical human body, about rap more and more rapidly through space. And then beside that, in the 19th century, we also had the communications revolution, and the communications revolution occurred simultaneously with the advent of the telegraph and the telephone and the wireless, and then eventually the radio and television and now the internet. So we've had a gradual speed up there as well. And he says that it's out of that thread, that out of the communications revolution, that this acceleration of reality that we are now in has, has come about. And it has come about with such speed that we cannot keep up with it, and we cannot come up with a political economy of speed that can match it and regulate it. And he says that one of the things, as a result, uh, that happened was precisely the 2008 global financial crisis came out of this. It, it was rooted in the 80s shift uh, in uh, the shifting of uh, finance and the, stock and the stock exchange into global real time, its synchronization, and that the first crash happened in 1987 as an initial adjustment of the system. And that so now with uh, 2008, one of the things that brought it about was precisely uh, this flash trading in which insider trading can happen very fast and the same types of uh, the flash trading that happens very rapidly was used on the same computers that the defense industry uses and he says that this came about and, and it's it, it happened so fast and it's part of the shift into the absolute light speed rapidity of the economy now that we can't even keep up with it and it's impossible ever to, to fully regulate it and so he, he is very pessimistic about the possibility of this economy ever being regulated. And so um, <clears throat> the, um, one of the other things he says is that uh, one of the brilliant comments he makes in this book is that um, we're living in an age now in which uh, technology is making the, the uh, biblical mythology into a literal reality. He says if you look at what's happened in the past decade, we've seen biblical mythology become actual, first with the Twin Towers replaying the myth of the collapse of the Tower of Babel. That came about, and then he says immediately after that we got the, the flood myth with uh, Hurricane Katrina and the 2004 tsunami. And now he says that what's coming up next is the Exodus myth, uh, as we will see with global warming and rising sea levels and the disappearance of coastal cities, we will begin to see uh, massively uprooted populations drifting about in a kind of literalization of the exodus. Um, and so one of the things he sees is he, he says that um, we've had this kind of threefold aspect of history where uh, originally uh, exodus took place with this movement from a point in space to a promised land. You moved in a linear line from a specific point in place linearly to a promised land. And then eventually we moved into this phase with the rise of cities of sedentarization. And, but now this sedentariness has now given way to a kind of what he calls a closed circuit exodus. Uh, not so much today of a shift back to nomadism as of a shift of people around uh, moving in an exurban exodus from out of the suburbs, depopulating them, and moving about. Uh, part of what has made this possible has been cell phone technologies and portable technologies that enable us to pack up the city and take it with us wherever we go. So we're always in the city now. Uh, these cell phones connect us to satellites, and so no matter where we go, we're, the we're, city is always going with us. And so this has further contributed to the delocalization of the city and the spread of this kind of new neo-urban, uh, ex-urban nomadism uh, has been made possible by these technologies. And so we're leaving buildings behind in favor of the immobile speed of interactivity. 
Um, and the sedentary is, you know, he says the sedentary is someone who feels at home anywhere, whereas the nomad feels excluded everywhere. And um, so this is what, what he sees happening, uh, and um, he says that our cities have been, especially since the 2008 uh, sub, subprime crisis, uh, or 06, 07, uh, when the housing bubble burst, uh, a lot of our cities began to become seriously depopulated, places like Detroit, where the automobile industry was involved in all this and it's collapsed, and now Detroit is, is collapsing into an economic black hole. And other cities as well, he says that um, there's been a noticeable decline in population in both American cities and in Russian cities, so we are looking at an ex-urban exodus. And this is happening at precisely the same time that in big science, as he's written about in a previous book called uh, University of Disaster, that in big science we are looking exospherically for uh, an exospheric planet that we can all leave behind and migrate to so that we can look back and the Earth will be transformed as a star in the horizon of some distant planet. And he says this is all nonsense and it, it is not something that we need. And human being, as the word human from humus, hummus, the Earth implies, we're rooted in the Earth and our destiny is to be found here on the Earth, not in some, uh, not in these uh, fantasies of colonizing other places and times. And um, and so our relationship to places and realities is, is evaporating with, with the shift into real-time technologies uh, in which everything that happens uh, on the planet happens all at once and uh, we're expected to catch up with it or if we don't we're masochistically uh, made to feel that we've been somehow left behind. So Virilio is, he represents a tradition of thought that is similar to uh, Neil Postman and Marshall McLuhan in which, uh, and myself also, in which these individuals have come along and uh, we're not technophobes exactly but what we are against is this absolute unquestioning acceptance of the cult of technology which is nearly fascistic in the degree to which it thrusts these technologies upon us and expects us to conform to them whether we need them or not and no matter what the decimating effects of these technologies are upon our life and upon society we're simply expected to go along uncritically and so people like Virilio are not technophobes. Uh, what they represent is the, a chazura, a pause uh, in this cult of speed that stops and tries to shift us back into the space of delayed time in which we can move into a mental horizon where we can begin to reflect and think upon the implications of these technologies. And so he's upholding that tradition of critical theory and critical analysis that, that the mind needs to think about these things before we just uncritically, like the masses, just rush out and accept every little gadget and device that comes along without realizing, as Neil Postman used to say in his works, that every gadget that comes along undoes a previous way of life. Every new technology, just as, you know, this corresponds to really this idea that uh, just as every new technology brings along with it its own accident, its own propensity to error, uh, so Neil Postman used to say that every time a new technology comes along, it actually undoes some, some way of life, uh, just as, for example, the advent, of, um, the advent of television into pubs effaced singing in pubs. So nobody sings in pubs anymore because the television is there now, and it's effaced that. And uh, the recording of the creation of records and the recording of music led to the effacement of the tradition of uh, one's basic part of one's ed education being the learning to play a musical instrument. That disappeared with the, with the gramophone and the rise of, of recordings. And of course, the, uh, Jane Jacobs has talked about the effects of the automobile on the city and how it's delocalized and decentralized the city and pulled neighborhoods and communities apart so that uh, individuals retreat from each other uh, with these vast, massive distances and they retreat and disappear further and further away from each other. So it's as though human beings are now uh, imitating on Earth what's happening in heavens as planets and stars and galaxies with the, the Big Bang are slowly you know, being thrust away from each other. So too, technology on Earth is replaying this drama in which we as individuals are all drifting further and further away from each other. And we come up with technologies like this, like uh, Facebook and YouTube as desperate, in my opinion, the technologies of replacement, prostheses for these previous social modes, which were once based on proximity and nearness to one another. And now in order for us to connect at all, we have to have these electronic prostheses as substitutes for what used to be normal human uh, activity. And so one of the things, you know, um, Virilio has inspired me. I've, re uh, I've written a uh, manuscript uh, that will be my next book on uh, the globalization of disaster, largely as a result of my encounter with Virilio. 
I encountered Virilio's works while I was working on my book about uh, the cult and culture of celebrities, and I was reading Baudrillard and studying Baudrillard because he has a lot to say about that, about the simulacrum and so forth. And then so I came across Virilio's work, and Virilio inspired me to write about catastrophe and disaster because in the same way that Virilio says that fear has become a new surround, so too I think that catastrophe actually has become our new environment, and we're so surrounded with it, it it's become so ubiquitous, it's everywhere, every day on this planet some new catastrophe inflicted by technology is in constant process of unfolding and global warming is simply one giant accident that is happening uh, in slow motion with us inside of it but we don't even see it, we don't even realize that we're inside of catastrophe which is why I've called my new book uh, World in Catastrophe and Heidegger's sense of being in although in, in being in he didn't mean being inside of a spatial container uh, but I mean it, as Peter Sloterdijk has meant it, that we are indeed in a world, in a spatial container, and the spatial container now is catastrophe. We're surrounded by it. And, you know, in 2009, for instance, uh, two satellites crashed for the first time in, in orbit above the Earth. One, they were both going in, in opposite directions, and they crashed in orbit, obliterated each other. Nobody heard about this. You never hear any talk about it. Uh, but now we're surrounded with the debris of this satellite uh, collision that took place, and, and it surrounds us now. We're living inside of a series of global accidents that has become our new surround. And only our artists, poets, and thinkers are capable of bringing what has disappeared into invisibility by virtue of its very banality into the thresh across the threshold of subliminal uh, disawareness into the into the uh, the open region, as Heidegger would put it, of, of our dialogue with entities. Poets and artists do that, and um, I'm trying to do that as well. And so that should give you a basic introduction to some of the basic ideas of uh, Virilio with the, his dromology and aesthetics of disappearance and his information bomb and his accidentology. He is currently uh, working to create the world's first museum of the accident in uh, Europe, in Paris, I believe. And he's currently in his old age, and he, st but he still gives seminars, as I understand it, at the European Graduate uh, School. And uh, so I highly recommend this book that will be out in a couple of months, The Administration of Fear. It's only 100 pages, it's very short, and it provides you with a very good and concise synopsis of the main ideas of, of Virilio.